We are now live. Okay. And we're live. And we're live. Yay. <laughs> okay. Good morning, world. Good afternoon, world. Evening, world. Hi, guys. Sorry, I had to do that. I had to do yeah, that. Yeah, no, of course. We have to introduce ourselves. Okay. Um, let me just see. I hope everyone can transfer onto this platform because I've just opened a new window. Sorry, I had to do that. Okay, that's all good. All right. Hi, guys. Uh, welcome to Bridging the Realm. Uh, my name is Desi, and uh, today, as many of you already know, we'll be talking about the important age of Aquarius, which I'm sure many of you want to uh, learn everything about. Uh, so, um, I hope that you I hope that you guys can actually transfer into this new window because we're we've just opened up our new window for uh, the live with Steve, as I'm sure many of you already know. But um, just for those of you who are new to this channel uh, or new to uh, these channels in general, I'll just give a short introduction to Steve. And um, Steve Judd is a professional astrologer, and he's been an astrologer for over 40 years, uh, bringing amazing astrologers to, to the world. Uh, to date, he has done over 40,000 readings. That's 40,000, quite impressive. So um, a lot of history there and a lot of information there that I'm sure we'll all be able to uh, gain a lot of um, really, really important things from for ourselves. And his work includes uh, character analysis, location and relationship issues, past and present explanations, as well as future exploration and uh, anything to do with the evolution of astrology. So uh, Steve's evil twin brother, uh, sometimes known as the caustic astrologer, per uh, periodically surfaces through the media from uh, doing loads of radio talk shows and as well as uh, online events, uh, live streams and uh, a lot of YouTube videos where his popular blogs gain over thousand, thousands of views and uh, comments every day, as I'm sure many of you already know, as you're probably joining me from his channel right now. So um, yes, yeah, Steve is uh, very committed to catalyzing the world and helping the people to empower and to think for themselves. So it's a pretty big, pretty, pretty big uh, quest for uh, our world today, but I'm sure uh, a lot of people can agree with me that we do need people like Steve because this, Time that we're in right now is so confusing and just so chaotic that um, if we didn't have people like Steve, we'll just be a lot of us will be completely lost. So I'm sure you can all agree with me that um, we're very, very lucky to have him and to have him here with me today for the first time. So welcome, Steve. Thank you so much for being with me. <laughs> and hello, world. Nice one. How are you? How are you today? How are you coping with the pandemic and everything that's going on? Like lockdown. Still alive. Um, <laughs> Yeah, coping is the right word. Coping well. I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of all right with it because I wouldn't describe myself as a hermit, but I work from home anyway. And I'm quite used to not going out in the daytime. So, you know, to me, for me staying at home for yeah, it's it's a bummer not being able to go out so much, but I'm a, it's a lot better for me than it is for most other people. So I'm counting my fortunes. Mm, yeah, yeah, definitely. I've noticed um, with a lot of people yeah, who, who have already worked from home, it's pretty much, you know, for them, it's kind of, well, it's the same thing. You know, they're just working from home. Not much has changed. Just they can't really go out much. But uh, yeah, but if for other people who work, you know, out and go out every day, it's pretty different. And I know a lot of people who are kind of having not a hard time, but finding it very confusing and weird to stay at home for the whole time. So this is, this is changing uh, the future in a really big and permanent way. And we're nowhere near yet understanding some of the big changes that are going to have to come in as a result of this. Yeah. But within six months, we're going to be in a very, very different space. Mm. It's going to be fascinating to observe from a more objective perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, probably uh, not so much if you're actually in all the changes, but um, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to watch what happens and how people yeah. over everything. Yeah. yeah, God, I mean, I think everyone can pretty much feel it though. I think whether you're tuned in and all spiritual or not, you know, whatever people kind of like to call it, everyone can feel that, isn't it? Everyone knows that we're at this point of huge change. There's no going back. Whatever happened before happened. And now it's just kind of like this brand new, door is opening before us that 
I guess some people want to walk through, others don't, others want to go back, you know, it's kind of like, where do we go? What do we do? A couple of days ago, about four days ago, I was on one of my rare excursions out, I was in a friend's garden, and, for, and I'm 64 years old, and for the very first time in my life, I saw a song thrush. I've never seen a song thrush before, but a couple of them just landed in the tree opposite me and started wobbling. Wow. And I was like, and, and to hear the bees and see the birds, there's so many birds out there, and to see the wildflowers growing. And the idea of going back to the sort of nitrous oxide, nitrogen oxide from the cars and the chemtrails from the planes and, and, the, and, and the burgers and the processed <laughs> food, just kind of, ugh, I hope not. I hope not. Not, not as bad as it was. Mm, yeah. But, Definitely. The changes that are coming, Desi, they're going to be massive. The idea of going back to work in a concentrated office environment, mm. not going to really happen, you know? A lot more people are going to be working from home, so there's going to be a lot less cars on the road. Planes, when they come back, are going to be so much more expensive. And, and who wants to go on a cruise in the, any time in the next two or three years? Yeah, I don't think anyone would do The that. world is changing. Yeah. We're going to have to address individual mental health issues a lot more. Mm. We're gonna to have to change the way we deal with the elder generations and pay a bit more time and energy into our elders. Mm. Um, we're, we're, we're gonna to have to look at the way we relate to each other in terms of both family, relationship, social, can, there's things like pop festivals, music concerts, football grounds, churches, anywhere where people congregate in big numbers, that's going to be a contentious one in years to come. So, yeah, we may be seeing the end or at least a massive change in that type of congregational way. Mm. So, yeah, stuff to we'll, we'll see in the next six months. Yeah. I'm kind of sad about the concerts, though. I mean, concerts are always nice to go to. <laughs> so now we're like, oh, we'll just watch YouTube from home. <laughs> yeah. You're speaking to a long term. Glastonbury veteran. Yeah. You know, I've, I've been, I must have been at Glastonbury 10, 15 times in my life. I was one of the people who run all the green fields. So, yeah, I'm, in a way, I'm fortunate because I've had my times at festivals and things like that. But that doesn't mean I don't want to go again. The idea of never being able to go clubbing again is like, oh, yeah, yes, you could do at home, but oh. Yeah. That's going to be terrible. No, we need music. Like the music sound, you know, it makes the world spin, right? We need, that kind of culture, but I guess it would just be different the way. Yeah, it won't, it won't fade, it'll be, but it'll, it'll be different, yeah. Mm, wow. Yeah, well, I guess this is the time for creativity, isn't it? It's the time for us to mm. redo everything to just make it better in a way. And um, it was really interesting, actually, I was listening to someone um, speak about this earlier and um, they were talking about this idea of um, how a lot of people now are you know, quite empathic and they can feel people's energies. It pretty much, I mean, we're all made out of energy, right? So we can all feel each other's energy constantly. Um, and maybe they were saying that maybe this social distancing is not such a bad idea because, um, I mean, being quite sensitive myself, I know that I can get really affected by other people's energies around me. So that social distancing and having the space for myself is actually quite good because it gives you the chance to recharge. Obviously, we don't want too much of it because then you don't want to be alone all the time. But there is, I think, a good balance is a need for sure, because a lot of people are not actually aware how sensitive they are to other people's energies and to people, to, to just energy around them, you know, uh, whether you're, you know, in a house or in living in a specific space that where the energy is not so good, that also can affect us a lot. So maybe this is a good time for people to start becoming a lot more aware of how the outside is affecting the inside. Well. I, I agreed. Um, as an astrologer, I see all things. I see the happiness and the joy, and I see the aggression and, and the challenges. And uh, I, I get what you mean about the need for people to reclaim their own individual space, but at the same time, not at the point of destroying the essence of community. Oh, for yeah. example, in England, tonight at 8 pm, a lot of people will be going out their front doors and applauding the NHS. Now, in my street, Three weeks ago, there was about six of us doing it. Two weeks ago, there was about 15 people, and including a couple of kids with saucepans. Mm -hmm. Last week, there was about 30 people with saucepans and tambourines and one trumpet. So tonight, I'm taking my djembe out there, and there's going to be loads of people out there, and we'll have a really good 
music, yeah. clapping, shouting, whooping, trumpet playing, drumming for a couple of minutes, and then we'll all come back in and get on with our lives again. Maybe this will be the new way of partying, you know? <laughs> well, you've seen that town, in the, drums. <laughs> that town in the north of England called Belper, where every day, it's, I think it's five, six or clock, everyone leans out the front door or the front window and just moves like the cow noise. And the whole town does it. And it's like, okay, that's weird, but it's really good because yeah, yeah. community. Mm. The thing about humans is we are gregarious by nature. And humanity has something that I don't think any other species on planet has really, ever really had, at least to the quality we've got. We can laugh at ourselves. Mm. We can take the mickey out of ourselves. And that gives us, I don't know, a degree of self-reflective consciousness, a self-reflectiveness that, that stops us taking ourselves too seriously. And I, and I love the human, especially British, but human humor. Definitely. So. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Oh yeah, we can definitely make a fool, fools out of ourselves, which is nice because it's nice. It's good not to take everything too seriously because life is too serious anyway. So we need to have those breaks where we just laugh and don't think about the seriousness of life. My, my, as many people know, my tag on my email has been for decades, for de two decades now, negativity. Uh, oops, so I think the uh, sound, the sound's gone off. Um, something happened, let's see. Is there a mute button that uh, went off on there? No, I'm good to send. Uh, I can, I can hear you, I can hear you. Okay, right. okay, maybe it was just me. Okay, great. All right, well, we have quite a lot of people here today. Wow, 300 people, nice. All right, uh, guys, just to let you know, if you, if you do have any questions, uh, do write them at the end. So uh, in about 15 minutes, you can please put your questions in and we can um, go ahead and ask um, Steve, um, you know, uh, fire away with all the questions and please put question in capital letters so that we know it's a question. So, um, but yeah, before we get into the whole age of Aquarius, which I'm sure everyone wants to kind of um, know about, um, let's start off with you and let's um, talk about, tell me about how you started uh, this whole thing in astrology. For anyone who might not know, I'm sure a lot of people have already followed you for a long time and know, but for anyone who might not know, how did you start this and what drew you to astrology in the first place? <laughs> I left home when I was 15. And when you were 15 in 1970, the only way to leave home was to join the army. So I joined the army. And when I crashed my first tank, they quickly worked out I wasn't cut out to be a proper soldier. So they run a lot of intelligence tests on me and found I was really good with ciphers and codes. I left the army when I was 20 for reasons that I'm not going to go into live on, live on, on screen. And, um, and then joined the cult of counterculture that was developing in the mid 70s in the south of England. And after experimenting with a few things I probably shouldn't have done for a couple of years in the mid 70s, Someone then put this book of astrology in front of me. And I went, oh, that's symbols. Oh, I get that. And then around about 1980, I read some stuff on astrology that really sort of made me think, whoa, 1979, I could, this is really interesting. So in 1980, I started learning how to do it. And then in 1981, I started doing horoscopes for other people. And then in 1999, uh, I started doing it full time on the telephone lines on, as it was just emerging at that time. And that's when I got my first software. And then since 2000, doing readings has been my only source of income. And I just happened to hit astrology at the same time as the computer age generated. For the first 15, 18 years of my astrological life, there were no computers or very few. So you had to do it all by hand. So, but just as I really started getting into the into my prime, so the computer revolution happened, and all of a sudden, instead of being able to do one a day, I could do six a day. And it's like, whoa! So, and uh, and 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 just the story goes on. So great! I I'm, I I consider myself blessed. I always say that people don't find astrology; astrology finds people. Uh, that means that astrology is not an it. I call it a she. And she found me at just the right time. And since that time, I know she found lots of other people, many of whom will be watching this. And, and for all the different theories and books and courses, the single best way to become a good astrologer is just simple. It's practice, practice, practice. Do as many chart readings as you can and just don't ever stop. There you go. 
<laughs> and we've oh, we've done a thousand readings. So I think that says a lot about you know how good you were and the fact that you have so many people coming back to you over and over again. So I think that's pretty telling in itself. That yeah, I, I've done about forty thousand readings, but fifteen thousand of them were over a period of about three years on the phone lines. Wow. When I was working sort of 40, 50 hours a week mm. and doing sort of five readings an hour. Mm. And, and that's when, that's when you, you pick the phone up and you go, hello, my name's in Steve. I'm an astrologer. When's your birthday? Bang. When's your date of birth? Bang. When's your birthday? Bang. And you're off. Mm. And you've got no time to think about it because they're paying top dollar. Mm. So I, that's where I cut my teeth. That's where I learned to be sharp. So. I see that, yeah. Everyone's got a different way of doing it, but the more you do it, the more you practice, the better you become. Yeah, no, definitely. And I, and now that you mentioned it, yeah, I really like how kind of straight to the point you are, you know, you don't beat around the bush and, you know, try to word things in a different way. It's kind of like, right, this is, you know, this is what this means for you. And this is why, you know, you do this and that. So <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't describe myself as subtle or tactful. <laughs> but that's good because people sometimes, you know you need that you need someone to just tell you straight up this is why you do this because you have this in your chart and that makes so much sense because it's and then you're like okay wow I, that makes sense for me now because and now i don't think i'm crazy <laughs> so yeah. yeah oh yeah 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 you get a lot of that yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, <laughs> it seems yeah. like half my job is reinsuring people that actually you're really you're in touch you're sane you're not making it up and it is happening and it's okay mm. And, and you see the look go across their eyes when they think, oh, thank God for that. It's like, yeah, all right. Yeah, wow, crazy. Well, okay, um, well, let's get into it. You know, Age of Aquarius, big name, but I think a lot of people don't actually really know what it means. I don't think I even know what it means, even though I have an Aquarian, you know, I'm an Aquarian star sign and I still don't know what it means. And this, I have to say in the beginning, I was very kind of, um, you know, like, yes, Age of Aquarius, here we come, nah, nah, nah. and then now, <laughs> I'm kind of like, oh no, what's going on, you know, <laughs> it's not starting good. Okay. But, yeah. <laughs> we, we can get into the meaning of the Age of Aquarius later. Hmm. But first of all, can I take five minutes to actually explain what it is? Yes, yes, go ahead, yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to keep it as simple as I can. The Earth has three different movements. It spins on its axis every 24 hours. Hence, we got the day. It goes around the sun once a year. But there's a third movement, and that is that its axis spins very, very, very slowly. Very slowly. And there's a cycle and it's called the procession of the equinoxes. Mm. And it takes about 25,900 to 26,000 years. Mm. And what that means, if you read it in real terms, is that when I was born 64 years ago, the spring equinox, zero degrees Aries, the very start of the zodiac, was always on March the 20th. The procession of the equinox means that the spring equinox point moves one degree every 72 years. So now the spring equinox is on March the 21st. And in another 70 years time, it's going to be on March the 22nd. And in another 70 years time, it'll be on March the 23rd. And if you move those 360 individual degrees, one degree every 72 years, you end up with 25,920 years, the procession of the equinoxes. So the actual zero point of Aries is when you look at the sun and the sun is at that point between Aries and Pisces. Now, there's something called the fiducial point i'm not going to get too complicated on this <laughs> long ago long ago the constellations of the zodiac in the sky fitted the 12 sort of banana shapes from the north pole to the south pole that constitute the signs of the zodiac but over the last two and a half thousand years the stars in the sky have moved slowly we can't see it in one lifetime 
But over a thousand years, you can see how the, the constellations have changed shape slowly, but very slowly, but gradually, consistently. So over two and a half thousand years, they changed a lot. So now the constellations in the heavens bear no resemblance to the actual positions where they were two and a half thousand years ago, which is why sidereal astrology and tropical astrology are so different. And this is why a lot of people will go, oh, astrology doesn't work. There's actually 13 signs. It's the 13th sign of the Zodiac. And, and, and Scorpio is only 10 degrees long and Capricorn's 48 degrees long. It's like, no. Right. It's, it's, it's... If you say that each seven, every 72 years, the point of the spring equinox moves forward one degree, then every 30 degrees is 2,160 years. This is known as an astrological age. So if we go back 2,000 to 2,100 years ago, we see the start of the age of Pisces. Now, this has been, during the age of Pisces, the age of religion, the age of suffering, the time of suffering, the time of sacrifice. If you go back before that, before the age of Pisces, there was the age of Aries, mm. for, which run from about um, 2300 BC to about 100 BC. Mm. And this was the age of the Ram. And if you look back in history, you will see that uh, the Romans and the Greeks, they had the Ram, the goat, as a major power symbol. If you go before that, from about 4,400 to 2,300 BC, it was the age of Taurus. Mm -hmm. This is the time of uh, um, um, Crete, the Minotaur, Abraham, the Old Testament, and the fatted calf. We worship the bull. Mm -hmm. Before that, 6,600 to 4,400 BC, it was the age of Gemini. And this is where... You know, five, six thousand years ago, this is where communication, networking, Gemini traits became much more of an important thing to emerging humanity. Before that, 8,700 to 6,600 BC, it was the age of cancer. And this was when tribes began to break into smaller groups like families. And before that... 10,900, 11,000 BC through to about 8,800 BC was the age of Leo. And this was when the flood happened. Now, one bit of sort of synchronous evidence to back this up. It's well known by now and accepted that the Sphinx on the Gaza Plain in Egypt is actually a hell of a lot older than the pyramids. Yeah. Pyramids were built about 2,000, 1,800, 2,000 BC. The Sphinx comes from about 10,000 BC. And first of all, it's meant to be a lion. And it was built in the age of Leo. It was when Leo was rising on the spring equinox 10,000 years ago. And um, also the base of the Sphinx is really weathered by being immersed in water for so long. So this was the time of the floods. This is when Britain split from the rest of Europe. It's when the flood happened all over the globe. The ice caps melted and the trauma destroyed the proto-human races at that time and probably pushed them from being right brain into left brain and, and started a whole new cycle again. And, and here we are, half a session, half a processional cycle on from that time. And it's like we're on the point of some type of new evolutionary leap, I think. So each, each astrological age takes 2,160 years. Thus, we are about on the point of the emergence from the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius. Astrologers love arguing about when the actual date is. Mm. When do you okay. think? <laughs> and I've got lots of information on that, but we'll come to that, we'll come to that another time. Okay. So this, this is actually what it means, the age of Aquarius. Mm. It means that where we, the, the procession of the equinoxes has moved the Earth's wobble so that we're now facing a different constellation for the next 2,000 years. Mm. Mm. Wow. Sounds complicated, it isn't. 
<laughs> just trying to work it out in my mind right now. No, but it's really interesting. Thank you for that. Cause it's very interesting to see um, with going back through the ages, uh, you can kind of see how each one corresponded to the specific sign as well. For example, Gemini in communication. And yes, uh, Desi, look, yeah. if you've got something like this, you've got no, a, little, a little spinning top. When you've got a little top that you spin, right? Yeah. And it goes round and round and round like a top does. Uh, eventually, yeah. it moves, yeah. Eventually, the top begins to wobble very slightly around, 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 around. And that's what the procession of the equinoxes does. Oh, so it kind of just moves like this. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Wow. So now, so that means now we're exactly on the opposite side of where we started, which was Leo. So now we're... Well, yeah, 12,000 12, BC, 11,000 BC, was, we are entering the age of Leo. Now, around that time, it was the very end of the Stone Age, the very end of the Neolithic Age. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we were... <sighs> Neanderthal man had, had disappeared. We were now fully Homo sapiens. We were beginning to stop being nomadic and settling into tribes, beginning to farm fields. Maybe that's what the age of Virgo was about before that. We were beginning to form homogenous groups and not being so nomadic. So, yeah, 12,000 years on, 12,600 years on, half a processional cycle. We're at, a, we're at a pivotal point in human history. I'll come back to that one later. That's a, that's a big one, yeah. Doo, doo, doo. <laughs> okay, so tell me about when was this term first used? Do we have any history on that? When was it first used? When, was it um, first coined? when people talk about the age of Aquarius, normally other people will just jump in and go, oh, that's all new age mumbo jumbo, mm. right? So it's not just the age of Aquarius that's, that's in the terminology, it's also the term new age. Mm. Now, the first person to use the term new age that I've been able to resource and that when I did my master's degree, I was taught that this that the first new age usage of the word was from Emanuel Swedenborg, a Swedish mystic in the 1780s, 70s, 90s. And his work directly influenced both Edgar Cayce and William Blake, both of whom were prominent new agers from the past. So... Um, the words new age has been around for 200, 220 years. They were in common parlance by the time we were into early Victorian ages. And by the time the theosophists, the theosophists and the Rosicrucians were at their peak around the 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, the new age was on everybody's lips. The age of Aquarius itself, the earliest reference to it that I've found is somewhere from the 1930s. Carl Jung did reference it once, but in modern parlance, I'm really ashamed to admit this, but in modern parlance, um, it's that bloody record. That, oh, the... Which record? The Dawning of the Age of Aquarius, oh, yeah, okay. from Hare, the musical. Ah, okay, okay. But that was in the 60s, and that is now kind of 50, 55 years ago. Mm. So it's a couple of generations ago. So it's now become an established term yeah. in the last 40 or 50 years. So that record definitely helped it. <laughs> the record helped it, yeah. Brought it into modern culture, modern language. Mm. Yeah. yeah, now I think people just use it a little too sparingly and they're not, it's, they're not quite sure why, what exactly it means. But yeah, I think that's, um, thank you for explaining that because that makes sense now okay so definitely so started with a mystic which is okay that makes sense because it's all kind of spiritual based and yes with aquarius yeah mm. okay so um t let's get into a little bit about what kind of what what does that involve you know the age of aquarius what how can we even begin to grasp the concept of the age of aquarius and aquarius in itself if we look back over the last two two thousand years 2,100 years. In the vast majority of that time, in 95% of the last 2,000 years, humanity, humanity has spent 90% of its waking hours working in the fields, bringing the harvests in, tilling the earth. And then on the one day a week, when we weren't working, we went to church 
or some other type of organized religion where uh, priests looked after our spiritual needs for us, regardless of the religious concept. Many people suggest that with the dawning of the age of Aquarius, so industrialization happened, and that we stopped being such a uh, close-knit community and became more of a kind of not so much robotic workforce, but mechanization happened. And um, since that time, since the first steam engines leading to the latest technological ability, hence my talking to everyone here, which has only been 160 years from start to finish, because, you know, the first steam engines were 1840, it's 170 years ago, it's not that long. Um, we're now seeing the emergence of far, far less ideas about organized religion, organized spirituality, and instead we're seeing much more the emergence of mechanization, machinery, artificial intelligence, uh, and a more kind of detached, impersonal, objective way of dealing with the world, rather than the uh, religious, devoted, faith-orientated times of the last 2,000 years. Now, that doesn't say mean to imply that uh, religion, faith, belief is, is a non-starter, because obviously it's an essential part of our lives. But the way we approach this is going to be very different in the future. As I said, with this virus that's just going on now, churches are closed and all of a sudden services are being streamed all over the world. Now, if you had said this to the churches even one year ago, but they were going to have to close all the churches and just stream all their services, everyone would have went, no. But it's happening now. So I kind of think we're not going to go back to that organized congregations again. So the whole thing about religion and all of the spiritual aspects that go with it is being upgraded into a more technological way of doing it i mean god is in the machine now but and everyone's got their own relationship with the divine however they choose to see the divine as being that's different to ever before yeah it's like everything is going online now and you know religion is going online spirituality is going online everything is just uploaded into this big computer in the world basically yeah it does yeah. make you a little bit worried because all we need is one big solar flare and that's that everything crashes but you know let's not go down that road at the moment <laughs> yeah but um it's interesting about the religion and you know that was all in the age of pisces right in pisces it's kind of all about uh, the 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 mystery what we don't see the veil and the, and you know now with so much stuff coming out about you know the religion and everything that was going on in, inside the catholic churches and things like that you know the accusations and stuff that had happened like years and years ago um that was all the things that we're now being shown right this veil is being lifted in front of us and we're starting to see what was actually going on behind closed doors and behind these so-called you know um, very um sort of godly places and things like that which yeah, well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get too controversial about the church on this video because I've already my views are well known on organized religion and what I call old men in skirts. But um, it is fascinating that at this time, just as technology is really emerging, just as new attitudes towards spirituality, community, and social life are emerging, so a lot of the old patterns, the old ways of governance, the old ways of belief and religion are collapsing and we're finding that actually they were not holier than now, they were essentially corrupt and, and empowered by people who were just using it for their own gratification. Not all of it, of course not all of it. There's always bad apples, there's always good apples, but it wasn't as it was purported to be. So I look forward to a future where everyone works out their own spiritual relationship with the divine. I have a great relationship with spirit. I don't necessarily talk to God every day, but I've got a great relationship with the up, what I call the upstairs department. Mm, yeah. You know, get they speak to me, I speak to them. That works. No, I think that's really important. And I think now, especially with, and you mentioned it in your video earlier today, I think about 
now is the time for people, you know, this whole isolation is making people, you know, spend time by themselves, but also go inside, you know, go in the inner world and, 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 and ask themselves, you know, what do they believe in? What do they not believe in? It's really about kind of restructuring our own beliefs, isn't it? Now it's like trying to ask us, ask ourselves all these questions that we thought we maybe knew the answers to, but now maybe we're starting to realize maybe we need to tweak that a little bit and yeah, and, and I think that one of the side effects of all of this isolation is that we're going to see a sudden upturn and surge in creativity coming out because people have been stuck indoors and they're either going inside and going, oh, I don't like being on my own, or else they're going to be going, I can write, I can draw, I can paint, I can do music, and they're going to find their creativity coming out. So I suspect we're on the point of a real artistic boom. Mm. It'd be wonderful, wonderful. Whole new art. Yeah. which is very Aquarian isn't it because the Aquarius is all about invention and new things yeah and yeah. yeah and it's also about self-empowerment yeah it's about kicking off the yoke of imposed doctrines whether it be the boss telling you how to do your job or the priest telling you how to think or, or the government telling you how to behave it's it's now about individuals doing it for themselves and they're not I'm not encouraging anyone to break the laws obviously you can bend the rules a little bit, but obviously you don't break them. But as I said to you before we came on air, one planet, six billion different worlds. Mm. Everyone's responsible for their own perception. Everyone's responsible for the way they choose to see the world as being. Mm. So you can choose to see the world as a horrible place where there's cabals of older men trying to control, dominate, manipulate the world. And all of them billionaires are secretly plotting against us and everyone's got to be compulsory vaccinated. Or you can choose to see the world as a really beautiful place where communities are coming together. Everyone's beginning to smile at each other a bit more. And there's genuine hope for the future. Yeah. It's up to you. It's your choice. Yeah, definitely. And, um, and yeah, it's really important, the community and also the aspect of the whole mental mental health, which you've also mentioned before about kind of trying to, you know, trying to understand our inner world and how that connects to the outside as well, isn't it? And trying to understand how we think, how we feel, whether we're actually being influenced by certain outside things in terms of how we're thinking, how we feel about particular things. So I think that's been, that's pretty important. And I think a lot, mm. more, a lot more people are becoming aware how we have been influenced to to a huge extent by outside things and you know belief yes. systems yeah so in, in a weird way this virus situation around the world has caused a lot of people to become a hell of a lot more self-empowered yeah. and I, I i i would never have thought i would say that even three months ago <laughs> but here we are yeah, wonderful you know, you're saying it now yeah <laughs> twice <laughs> um yeah well uh, i, I want to go back a little bit uh, in terms of the astrology and tell me about uh you mentioned before that Newton was involved at some point, and how, how did he get involved exactly the whole... Well, um... Where does Newton come into it? Newton and uh, Coper Copernicus? Copernicus? Copernicus. Copernicus, yeah, okay. <laughs> Copernicus in the 1590s was the first person to realise, 1580s, 1570s, was the first person to publicly state that the planets went round the sun oh. instead of all the planets and the sun and the stars going around the earth. And of course the church persecuted him because the earth was the center of the universe. Right, but Copernicus proved it wasn't. And of course he got castigated. And I'm not sure if he got killed by the church. I think he may have done, but he was really very heavily persecuted. He had to recant, blah, blah, blah. Hundred years later, Galileo said the same, and he was also persecuted. But a hundred years later, Newton came along, and it was Newton who first worked out the the actual number of seventy two years per degree of precession. the The idea of precession itself comes from a chap in the, uh, uh, a chap a Greek a Greek astronomer and astrologer, because astronomy and astrology were one and the same thing until the invention of the telescope. Um, a chap called Hipparchus in 127 BC, he was the first person to actually suggest that the stars in the sky were going backwards one degree a year slowly. And he almost hit on that 72 degrees, but he didn't have the mathematical tools that Newton did. And Newton was the first person 
to actually work it out precisely. Mm. Uh, the world owes a debt to Isaac Newton. Newton is seen as most people know about Newton and gravity. Most people know about Newton and mathematics and physics, etc., etc. What not many people know is that Newton was also an extremely talented alchemist and magician. Not many people know that. It's, I didn't know that. No, he knew a lot of different things. And um, he's one of the very few people to actually have his own uh, mausoleum in Westminster Cathedral. Mm. It's a fascinating mausoleum as well. There's, there's a lot of very interesting symbology here around that particular part of the cathedral. It's the Abbey, not the cathedral, Westminster Abbey. Yes. Oh. So yeah, Isaac Newton was it was very important on this. Um, before him, hmm, before him was a very important individual. Around the time of the around, I think it was fifteen eighty five through to about sixteen thirty two. He died in his late thirties, early forties. Lived a chap called Nicholas Culpepper. Now, anyone watching, you go and talk to your grandmother or, your, or your, your grandfather or someone like that, you'll probably find a copy tucked on their mantelpiece right out of the way of a book called Culpepper's Herbal. Nicholas Culpepper was the first person ever to translate all the old Latin surgical texts into English. Oh, okay. And he gave the common man in England, and the common woman, of course, power over their own bodies. Until then, all the surgical texts, all the medicinal texts were written in Latin. So no one could understand apart from the elite, the surgeons and the doctors who could read Latin. So no one had power over their own illnesses apart from the doctors and surgeons. Culpepper translated it all into English. So the, the, uh, the body of surgeons did take out a couple of assassination contracts on him. They didn't get him. Um, Culpepper also compiled 30 years of study into Culpepper's herbal, where he, uh, he, he wrote out descriptions of something like two, three hundred different herbs, their astrological symbols, the times to plant them, the times to pick them, and the ways to use them, all according to astrology. Wow. And Culpepper, in his book, Culpepper's Herbal, in, in, the, in the section which says how to use these herbs, it, the very first sentence is, I address myself firstly to those that study astrology and secondly to the profane. Now, it's from Nicholas Culpepper that we understand the basics of modern herbology, how herbology and astrology ultimately are linked. And it's only a little step from there to homeopathy. Mm. I swear by homeopathy and herbalism. Mm. It is a choice. Many people would just be switching off now, going, homeopathy is total rubbish. It can't work. The science proves it. Mm. I don't care what the science says. I know it works. Mm. People say to me, do you believe in astrology? And I say, no, because I know astrology. Yeah. I know homeopathy and I have a really good homeopath and she knows what she's doing. And a number of my very close friends use homeopathy all the time. It works. So this knowledge it's not new, it's been passed down over the millennia, but it's been translated and upgraded as we go into the 21st century. Mm. And it kind of points towards a more holistic way of looking at our lives, seeing how the environment, the plants in the earth, the trees, the animals, ourselves, we're all interconnected in some shape or form. And if that sounds like hippy dippy left-wing socialism to some people, well, that's fine, that's your opinion. But it's a fact, the holistic paradigm works and it's something that's only evolved in common consciousness over the last 30 years or so so yes here's another example of the emerging age of aquarius yeah definitely um this reminds me of the kind of like you know the witchery and the witches uh, kind of <coughs> and potions which you know but that's what they did they knew when to plant them and they knew when to harvest them yes. and, yeah so that's really I, I believe that witchcraft, the persecution against witchcraft is actually the persecution against the feminine because witchcraft is basically a knowledge of herbalism. Yeah. And there's an interest 
even today with all the major agrochemical merchants uh, and the big pharma, they don't want people to use herbs. Mm. They want them to use their chemical medicines. Yeah. So, of course, they're going to continue persecuting the old beliefs and the old ways of doing things, even if they're much healthier than the big pharma because they don't make money. Mm. Classic example. I can go out to my local park 20 yards away, 30 yards away, and I, on a certain period of the year, around September, October, I can go into the bushes and I can pick up a little herb called eyebright. I come back, put it in a pot, pour boiling water on it, make a poultice, stick it on my eyes. Hey, my vision gets better. Oh. Eyebright, euphrasia is the Latin term for it. It's been around hundreds of years. Oh, wow. It's wow. free. Okay. So anyone but, who wants to improve their eyesight, <laughs> eyebright. <laughs> I, it does what it says on the tin. Yeah. You know? And, and um, a lot of this knowledge, it's not been lost. It's been suppressed and repressed, but it's available if you know where to look for it. Yeah. And I think, well, do you think now with, you know, the age of Aquarius and this whole like divine feminine starting to be more pronounced, do you think that's going to be a lot more available now and people are going to start to look into that more? I don't know if it's going to become available a lot more. I do think that people are going to be searching for something a lot more meaningful with a lot more integrity in their lives and they're going to want something that's a bit more authentic and is that has a degree of life force in it. The, the idea is of taking a herb as opposed to a pill of chemicals. Now, there is a crossover. I mean, some pills work. Aspirin is mainly made from willow. But a lot of pills aren't. So the idea of taking a herb which has been growing in the ground and still has life force, it's the same as if you're eating fresh food that's straight from the fields that you pick yourself or that you know is fresh and it's organic as opposed to going to a burger chain and eating something that's been artificially GMO'd and that's the Where's the life energy in that? Where's the, where's the, where's the nutrition in that? Mm. I'm sure it's there in the chemical constituents, oh, but in yeah. terms of the, of, the, of the life force. Mm. Yeah, because yeah, essentially it's the energy from those things that we're taking in, isn't it? It's the energy from the plant, from the whatever we're taking, yeah. Mm. And when you're taking in the animal of, a, of, of the energy of an animal that's been slaughtered in fear, and all that fear has gone into its blood, and then it's put into the burgers that you eat, and it's, you don't want to eat fear. Mm. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> it's interesting. Yeah, you say that. I mean, I probably should mention it, but uh, there is, uh, you know, people who can see, read energy and aura, they can actually see when that happens. So they can see when you're eating a burger and the fear, you know, the energy frequency in that burger going into your body and then your body kind of resonating with that. So it's not, not pretty. But anyway, <laughs> no. At the same time, at the same time you've got, you, 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 you cannot sort of judge people yeah. on what they eat or, or their, their lifestyle choices. It's a free world. You can do what you like. You can do what makes you feel good. If you want to go and do that, fine. Mm -hmm. But there's an element of intelligence here. And being intelligent doesn't mean being clever or smart. Being intelligent means making appropriate choices that is for your long-term benefit and the benefit of the world as well. Mm -hmm. So by having a healthy diet, having a healthy lifestyle, you're making your life better. And the better your life is, the better lives of people around you and the planet around you is. Mm. It permeates. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I guess it's just uh, having, taking that responsibility of knowing what you're doing is having an effect on everything else around you and you know, mm. vice versa. So tell me about, tell me about that aspect of responsibility because it's, it's been coming up a lot, especially this year. And um, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's related to Aquarius, the Aquarius <coughs> thing, or whether it's related to Saturn or one of the planets, but the whole responsibility stuff, it's really coming well, up. This is where the timetable for the age of Aquarius really becomes important. If, if you go online, or oh, look, well, let's put it this way, my tutor on my ME, Dr. Nicholas Campion, he's one of the best astrologers in the world. He, he actually did a lot of serious research and he, he found that something like, two, three hundred different dates for the age of Aquarius. And the earliest was around about 1750, 1760. 
with the discovery of Uranus, and the latest is about 2400. Mm. Um, but everyone thinks they're living in a golden time. Every generation that's ever lived has always seen advances on the previous generation. So every generation that's lived has thought they're living in the golden age because they've got new tools, new inventions that the previous generations didn't have. We're no exception to this, but that is going on an escalatory curve. Come to that another time. That's eschatology, and I'll come back to that in a bit. But with the timetable, there are a growing number of astrologers who are looking back to the time, and I can't remember the actual date. I believe it was May 1962. Two could have been 65. It was May 62, when there was a couple of day period where there were seven planets in Aquarius. Mm. Now, something like that's extra extraordinarily rare. Mm. Uh, the Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn were all in Aquarius for a couple of days. And like uh, that doesn't happen. So that's hugely symbolic. Mm. When you fast forward to in, in, the last, in the last 60 years, the intensity of the large-scale astrological patterns in the sky is unlike any other time in history. It's set perhaps at the end of the 1400, 1490s. Um, there was a time in the mid-60s when Uranus and Pluto were conjunct in Virgo, and that transformed, forcibly transformed, it brought the hippies and it transformed the way we, we sort of manifested our social mores, our social ethics and morals. There was in the 1980s, there was the massive conjunction, first of all, of Saturn with Uranus and then Saturn with Neptune in Capricorn, followed by the Uranus-Neptune conjunction in Capricorn in the early 90s, 92, 93. And it was at this time that the first algorithms were being put down that birthed the internet. Um, then we've got the grand crosses that were happening in 1999, 2010, 2012, leading to the Uranus-Pluto square a few years ago, and then the massive conjunction of Jupiter, Saturn and Pluto that happened just a few months ago, and the ongoing situations astrologically of this year. And if you extrapolate this forward, then we're now looking forward to the massive conjunction of Saturn and Neptune at zero degrees of Aries, the very start of the zodiac, just as Pluto moves into Aquarius and Uranus moves into Gemini, and all of this is happening around 24, 25, 26, after which everything calms down for a long period of time. So this leads me to assume that over the last 50 years, we've been on a steadily accelerating astrological curve of intensity which has led us up to this time and for the next few years and that by the time we're into six years from now we're going to be entering a period of long-term calm now as to what state the world will be in in six years time that's negotiable but i suspect it's going to be very different to where we are now and it could be a really dystopian Judge Dread type world, or it could be a really beautiful place where there's a lot more equality around the world and that not so many people are, are still hungry, which would be nice. Yeah. But that remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of timetable, in, astrologically, there's a timetable in place. And uh, that fits with other things, especially the eschatological side of it, the, the part of us that looks at. Um, the acceleration of human evolution. Mm. That's something I'm really into as a kind of side hobby, if you like. Yeah, yeah, definitely evolution. Well, we are evolving now, isn't it, with everything. And just like you said, everything has been escalating to this point where now it's just gonna kind of flatten out for a bit. <laughs> but tell me about the, uh, cause I mean, I'm kind of trying to put this together in terms of everything that has happened this year so far and and you you know you were speaking from before about uh something huge happening in january on january the 12th i think it was and and we also you know we had the fires in australia and then we had you know just everything else kind of just escalated from the very beginning of the year 
and I guess this was all kind of this build up to now, right? To us entering into Aquarius a little bit. So how is the, how how are these aspects of Aquarius? How have these aspects of Aquarius already manifested? So, for example, the detachment we can already see is manifesting because of the isolation that we're in and everything else. What about the rest of it? Things like, you know, responsibility and things like that. Seems to me that in, in any type of situation, any type of environment, as we approach something new and we get very close to the launch point of something new, so the remnants of the old get desperate. And they still try and manifest quickly. Got to make this happen before the new kicks in. Got to try and stop this. Got to try and make that happen fast. And what we're seeing in the last year or two or three or 10, since about 2008, and up to now, and probably for another couple of years, is the death gasp, if you like, of the old ways. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're, we're heading into a revolution or a major change in lifestyle, although we probably are. Um, but I am suggesting that the big thing that's going to be changing is there's a change in consciousness. And that everyone's going to have a sort of a, a different mindset about the way they want their own individual world to be. And when that's hit enough people, it's going to suddenly take off. And then we will see the emergence of Aquarius. And then the old, the death gasp of the old, such as what we're experiencing now, will fade into the background. If you if you if you look at it particularly at this year, this virus is a great leveler. It's not selective of age or wealth or religion or anything. It's yeah. selective of immune system, but yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, it's um, it's a fascinating time to be alive. But yeah. I'm sure everyone who's ever lived has said that. Yeah, yeah, true. But I think we're really at the precipice of this isn't it we're at the, that brink we're on the cusp yeah um I, I i truly believe that by the by the time i reach my 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 rational lifespan which will be sort of early mid 80s another 20 years i will see the start of the new I, i'm pretty sure of that yeah i don't think i volunteered to come here to sort of leave just before it all starts i think i'll watch i think part of my reward for having persisted so long is to actually see the start of the new yeah no so, you have to hope see. So. i'm sure it will well with the way everything's been progressing so far it's been so quick especially in the last few years just like you said it's just been boom 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 and things are just like changing changing ta changing but um yeah i think one thing that really surprised me this year especially is how big this whole concept of uh almost like karmic return and and taking responsibility for your actions you know i think we're all on a global scale, we're all very much now thinking, okay, wow, my actions do have an effect, you know, whether it's, you know, we're looking at the uh, pollution we've created in the air, or whether with our own bodies, you know, how if we're not taking care of our immune system, then we, we have a likelihood of getting a virus or something or, you know, so it's this whole aspect of taking responsibility of your actions is so huge right now. I just, for me, especially, it's been very, really evident everywhere. So there's a point in the horoscope that's called the North Node. It, it was brought to Britain in the 1890s by the Theosophical Society. Helena P. Blavatsky brought it over, and it's a carryover from the old Hindu astrology. And with it, she brought the translation of the North Node as relating to words related to karma and reincarnation. And I struggled with this one for about 30 years until I realized that actually it came from a culture where at that time, 95% of people had the lion cloth they were wearing around their waist and a begging bowl, and that was it. And they lived hand to mouth every single day and they had no hope. So the only thing they could hope for was if they were good this life, then the next life maybe they'd be wealthier or richer or in a better lifestyle. So hence the concept of karma evolved over millennia. But we live in a Western culture, not an Eastern culture where there's um, everyone's more concerned around this life now rather than past lives or next lives. Yeah. Too busy living this life. So I've changed my ideas of karma. So instead, instead of looking at karma and reincarnation, I'm looking at the North Node in terms of mission statement, purpose, and why you volunteered to come to planet Earth in the first place, with the emphasis on the word volunteer. Why are you here? 
And I think a lot of people in the last few months, especially in the last few weeks, have suddenly started thinking along these terms. Why am I on planet Earth? What is my mission? Why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? And to many people, we're going to go, they're just going to go back to, OK, I'm going back to work. I'm going to go to watch the football. I'm going to go to the movies. I'm going to get married, have 2.2 kids, mortgage charger. Mm. Others will start expanding their consciousness and taking on bigger concepts and opening up to a different, different type of relationship with the divine and opening up to a different relationship with everyone around them and, and things will move forward. And eventually this will become the new normal, I believe. I, I hope. hope. Yeah, I mean, you can kind of see it already. There was a huge global meditation. Uh, I think it was on the 8th of April. Um, yeah. I think it was some sort of an astrological alignment again. So yeah, it's at both to Pluto conjunction, yes. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that was amazing because I, I took part as well and I know thousands of people did. So that was really nice because it was, you know, people, even though we all separated, we were all kind of coming together in a this energetic level, you know, spiritual level. And everyone, I hope, was hoping, you know, for the same thing, which was to get rid of the pandemic. <laughs> As I understand it, there was about a quarter of a million people involved in that. Yeah. And when you've got a quarter of a million people all around the globe, all at exactly the same moment, sending out a really positive vibe, that is going to have an impact. Mm -hmm yeah and yeah definitely and I, which i guess is again it's something quite aquarian isn't it because it's us coming together thinking about community and the future and in, inventive you know mm. invention and how we can basically progress from here onwards which is um hopefully us expanding our consciousness but yeah i've definitely felt that and i've been asking myself these questions like who am i why am i here what am i doing what is my mission in life so well in the last few weeks I've just started, after have deliberately, for the first time in years and years and years, I, I decided uh, to not do any readings for a few weeks when I was on first on lockdown, because just what, I need to clear my head to actually deal with this. And I started doing readings again last week. And um, the more I'm doing readings for people now, it's like there's a difference out there. And I've realised that now, right now, in mid-April, we're now past the first wave of 2020 yeah. and what's to come is still pretty damn massive uh it's going to be different to what's happened so far but equally as significant and i'd be failing in my duty as an astrologer if i didn't actually mention a couple of really really critical times that are coming up later this year yeah. um later this year the jupiter pluto conjunction will come back at the same time, Mars will move into Aries at the start of July. Normally, Mars moves into Aries for six weeks every two years. This time round, Mars is going to be in Aries for 27 weeks because it's going to go retrograde in Aries, its own sign. And, and when you say to astrologers, Mars is going to be in Aries for over half a year, you see them shiver because Mars in Aries is not a subtle and energy. And when Mars stops going forward and starts going backward, it's going to be standing still for a few weeks, squaring Pluto, Jupiter and Saturn. And there's a particular time that seems to trigger in maybe 50 percent of horoscopes of absolute critical times. And this is the period of about the 15th to the 24th of August. And there's so many people going to be getting their buttons pushed at that time. There's something incisive, surgical, sharp coming in at that time for a lot of people in a way that is going to create a, a fair bit of um, trepidation and potential challenge. After that, there's a new moon on the 16th of October which will be opposite Mars, square Jupiter, square Pluto, square Saturn. And that also is a critical time. But these are the last two times in 2020 where the energy is going to be at an extreme. When Mars starts moving forward and squares Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto for the third and final time in the last 10 days of December, by that time, both Jupiter and Saturn will be conjunct at zero degrees of Aquarius, Jupiter and Saturn are going to move into Aquarius in December, two or three days apart from each other. 
So all of a sudden, all the emphasis is going to go off of Capricorn and move into Aquarius. So yet again, Aquarius. And, and three years from now, Pluto's going to move into Aquarius. So three of the big five planets are going to be entering Aquarius in the next three few years, two of them in the next nine months. So yes, yes, again, Aquarius energy is going to be coming in, but let's get to the end of December. Next year is all about dealing with the changes of this year and finding the new normal. Next year is not going to be easy, but it's not going to be anything like as difficult as this year. Thank God. <laughs> I hope so. This year has not been easy. But um, cool. yeah, let's, can we, let's kind of, I really want to dissect Aquarius, just the sign itself and what it represents, because I feel like once we have a better feel of what Aquarius is, then maybe we are able to kind of maneuver better our way through what's coming. Um, I have to be, I'm aware that you're an Aquarian, right? But <laughs> Aquarius is fundamentally different to anyone else. Yeah. It's not... <laughs> to put it lightly. <laughs> yeah. If I say it's not normal, then most Aquarians will go, what do you mean I'm not normal? To which I'll say, well, you're not abnormal, but you're different. You're not better or worse, but you're different. And the more you try and be normal, the more you screw up. Yeah. Whereas the more you accept the difference and live according to them, the more stimulating and innovative you become. Aquarius is basically the sign of humanity, of community. But the idea of community is changing rapidly. For many years, for, well, for millennia, we've looked at community as in family. And then in the last 50 years, since the Second World War, communities expanded to include social groups, friends, social life. But recently, I'm starting to see a change. Uh, you know, it's got to the point where friends are becoming like family in that they expect you to behave in certain ways so that they feel comfortable in their dealings with you. And beyond friend and beyond family, there's another level of community that I'm trying to aspire to, and that's tribe. Because tribe, they're, they're all over the world, different color, shape, religion, age, everything. And they love you just the way you are. And if you make big changes, they still love you just the way you are. It's unconditional. And I, I do believe that this, this idea of tribe is something that's only going to catch on the more we get into uh, the Aquarian future. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're re, re, remolding and reshaping and recreating our notions of community. And that's got to be a good thing. Yeah, definitely. Oh, that's yeah, that definitely that's that's the positive side of Aquarius, <laughs> which is really good. What about the negative sides? <laughs> what can we expect from that? More well, Aquarians are are known for being quite robotic, detached, impersonal, cold, objective, brilliant <laughs> in emergencies. You know, if it's a heart attack or a car accident, they're there, and they save lives. Yes, no, black, white. But most of the time, they're a little bit of a cold fish on the surface. And yes, there is this thing about Aquarius that's very detached and impersonal, but it's an air sign. Mm. They don't really deal with emotion in terms of getting all uh, affected at an empathic and compassionate level. And that's not to say they don't have those qualities. Mm. It is to say that if necessary, they can override them and go, right, lives need to be saved, let's do it, bang. Mm. As opposed to getting, letting their emotions take control. And that's both robotic, but it's also very useful to, to the greater community. Uh, Aquarius is one of the more idiosocratic and one of the unusual signs of the zodiac, yes. And you can never categorize them. But then Uranus is ruled these days. It used to be ruled by Saturn. These days it's more ruled by Uranus and Uranus is the change bringer. And as soon as you start putting an Aquarian in a box, saying this is how they're gonna behave, They'll do something to upset the apple no, cup. Yeah, no. So, <laughs> no box, please. No. Yeah. No, that's pretty telling. Yeah. That that. And from from all the people that I Aquarians that I know, I can definitely see that. Any myself is kind of like. Um, of course, we do. I feel like um, Aquarian people, we can be be very good at being detached. We're very good at disconnecting. That I think that's very. It's like something that just comes very easy. And just knowing from how I am, I'm quite easy. 
you know, just detaching from something. But then underneath that, very, very, very deeply is, you know, all the emotions and everything else. But I think that's when the whole um, inner work comes in, you know, the whole notion of shadow work and working on, on yourself, because it's like all these yeah. things that are buried so deep and so it's like they've been there for years and years and years. And, you know, you haven't kind of gone in to dig deep and unravel these things. But now people are realizing that actually we do need to work on ourselves. We do need to unravel all these things that have been we've suppressed in ourselves. And I feel like maybe that will be showing up more as well. And that's well, yeah. And then we come back to, to the virus because so many people have been isolated. So they've had no, no, no option but to do a lot of shadow work. They've had no option but to go into their own caves to deal with their own psychology or to suppress it and repress it. But that's pretty toxic. But that's what this is. Again, it's down to choice. Yeah. One of the things that's going to change in the future, I really hope and I do believe, is that astrology is going to become much more accepted yeah. in the future as a true diagnostic tool for, for understanding ourselves and the world around us. Um, if it's okay with you, I'd like to give you three contemporary definitions of astrology. Okay. One is about eight sentences long and the other two are one sentence long and they're all fairly recent. Okay. There's a woman called Anne Geneva. She's, uh, she, she was a doctoral student doing a PhD at New York University, Stony Brook. And she's also the manager of the University Press in London. And she wrote a quote about the 17th century astrologers, which I paraphrased and adapted it to the modern astrologers. Astrology is not a science. It's not a religion. It is not magic. Neither is it astronomy, nor is it pluralism, singularity it's not neoplatonism it's not on its own psychology it's not witchcraft and it's not methodology it uses all of these tools it holds tenets in common with others and some people are very adept at several of these skills but in the final analysis astrology is only itself it is a unique divinatory and prognostic art embodying centuries of accredited methodology and tradition. Wow. Um, one of my tutors on my master's degree, Dr. Patrick Curry, he said, astrology is the practice of relating the heavenly bodies to lives and events on earth and the tradition that has thus been generated. And my own definition of astrology Astrology is a blend of mathematics, geometry, symbology, psychology, pattern recognition, and intuition. And without any or all of these qualities, it doesn't work. Wow. So it's not an art and it's not a science. It's unique, it's in between the two. Wow, I love that. I really love that. And I love that you included you know, psychology and all of that, because it is a very much a psychological based thing. You know, you're getting into someone's mind, you're getting into someone's world, right? Yeah. So it's kind of Carl Jung, who's the most eminent founder of modern psychology, because I don't have much time for Freud, but I do have a lot of time for Carl Jung. Carl Jung was an astrologer. And um, Carl Jung said something along the lines of creative imagination depends on the urge to reclaim and rediscover the future. You can't be creative in the imagination if you're not dreaming of the future, not trying to dream the future in. Yeah. Uh, he also penned wool lines along the lines of, he was sacrilegious in certain ways, he said, if we were immortal, would religion exist? Hmm. And I thought, hmm, good question. See, I don't really do, I don't believe in, death yeah i just believe in transition of consciousness yeah. to a different dimension of existence where where time in the different dimension doesn't work the same way as it does down here mm. so i know that when i get home there will be a party waiting for me yeah. many people just choose to believe that when you're dead you're dead end of but to me that 
that doesn't compute because what a waste of 60 70 years of experience yeah so i'm not i'm not i'm not i am looking forward to it but i'm not in a rush yeah. <laughs> no one is right now everyone wants well I, I i don't know about that but yeah a lot of people i guess want to see stay but tell me about well tell me about what you've learned from all of your years of experience and you know reading for people and and that it, because it is very much this psychology you're basically sort of like a counselor aren't you because you're not only describing someone's chart and you're telling them why they are the way that they are which to them starts to find something clicks in and makes sense um yeah. but you're helping them through their problems to understand themselves to understand i'm the giving them different different ways of seeing it yeah from a more objective and detached perspective mm. and that gives them a different way of potentially looking forward and and stop and getting out of the rut that they're in and seeing a different way of managing their future i, uh, I suppose the single most rewarding thing that i get from doing astrology is that I like to think I help other people aspire to something better. Mm. And, and it's not about doing it for other people. It's about giving other people the tools to do it for themselves. If you do it for them, they get addicted to you. If you give them the tools to do it for themselves, they become self-empowered. And then they go out and make their world a better place. So it resonates everywhere else. That's pretty important. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, almost so like you, you inspiration. Should... Yeah, would you say that you show them the, what their highest potential could be through their chart? Yes, and, yeah. and the pitfalls. Yeah, and the pitfalls, yeah. So what we need to be careful of as well. Yeah, yeah well, for every up, there's a down. You know, we, we, you've got to, at the end of the day, I don't have any, any belief at all in fate or destiny. I'm totally free will orientated. I believe that we all have choices to behave, to think, to act in what we do mm. by saying that that then invokes the idea of having a conscience and many people do not have a conscience mm. now that's not a negative thing it's just that they, they don't they just don't work like that yeah but again that's choice mm. yeah so so definitely i think it'll be good if we see more of the astrology becoming more normalized in sort of the regular uh, way yeah. It's got it's got to be a part of the future. It's got to be because without something like astrology, without an element of spirit or magic in our lives, we just become robots. Mm. We need something to inspire us in our dreams and our visions and ideas for the future. Mm. And astrology fits that package perfectly. When I was a kid, New technology meant having this wonderful little Baker-like thing with a dial on that you could ring numbers on and pick up and speak to people on a long bit of tube, a long bit of wire. Yeah. And, and we had these little wooden boxes with a little screen like that with black and white moving figures. Mm. When I was a kid, spirituality was Sunday school in the church. Mm. When I was a kid, there was two billion people. Now it's seven and a half billion people. The technology is what we're doing now. Spirituality is out the loop. It's, it's breaking free. Yeah. And the escalation of evolution is it's not going like that. It's going like that. Wow. And once it reaches prime vertical, which will happen very shortly within the space of my lifetime and the lifetimes of 95% of people watching this, then there's going to be a major change and it will either collapse in and go back the same way as it did maybe 12,000 years ago, or we'll expand beyond the parameters of the graph and achieve a greater degree of consciousness. And there'll be more awareness of the world we live in and the effects we all have. And hopefully a better community life sounds very aspirational and hippy dippy, but I choose to believe that's the yeah. potential. Totally. And it's kind of about what we do with our time right now and how we use it consciously to make decisions, better decisions. I think. Every, every moment we're alive, different timelines go into the future mm. from every moment. And, and so the idea of throwing fishing lines into the future and magnetizing a good future into ourselves by, effect, by what we're doing now affecting our potentials for the future, it's critical. 
Everything is based around now. If you, if you get semantic about it, there is no past. The future is history. The future is a mystery. All there is is now, and that's why it's called the present, because it's a really good gift. That's an old saying, but it's true. All there is is now, but that's semantic. Of course we can influence a future. Yeah. And ideally we want the best future. <laughs> ideally we want the best future, but that doesn't mean a future where you suddenly win the lottery and become a multimillionaire and have a jet and, and landed estates in Hawaii. Yeah. Well, it well, might do, depending on what you want. But that's not very Aquarian, is it? Aquarian will be more, okay, what, what is good for the community, right? What, how can we connect more with the community and do something together and as a community? And yeah. Classic example. There's a chap out there called Jack Dorsey. He's the guy who founded Twitter. He owns Twitter. He still runs it. He has just, in this last couple of weeks, donated a quarter of his fortune. He's a multi-billionaire. He's donated a quarter of his fortune to all the medical practitioners all around the world dealing with COVID-19. Now, everyone slags or slams down all of the, the Bill Gates, the Jeff Bozos, all, of the, all the multi-billionaires in the world. But you never, everyone criticizes them, but you never hear anyone complimenting people like Jack Dorsey, who's actually doing really good things with his money. Mm. So, you know, let's bring a bit of balance into this. Let's, let's play credit where credit's due. Definitely focus on the positive. Do you see more of that happening? Because um, I don't think Aquarius in general is a very kind of materialistic sign or in terms of money, you know. Um, so do you see more people maybe becoming more philanthropic and kind of giving? I, I, I hope so, because uh, I, what I do notice is that as one ages, as people age, yes, they a lot of people these days are going, well, I'm going to spend it so that before the kids get hold of it. Um, or they realise I can't take it with me. So it's not about how much you've got or it's becoming not about how much you've got. It's more about what you do with it that counts. It's becoming, I don't want to get into a kind of egotistical thing here, but a lot of people want to leave a good legacy behind them. Yeah. And it used to be that they would pay for their children's education or they would buy their children a house or, you know, something like that. And that will still happen, of course, but it will also involve looking after the community as well. Funding the medical care, funding the social care, funding the health of the elder generation. Mm, yeah, definitely. I think I think that's um, that's definitely a good start. And um, as you mentioned before, with the whole tribe, you know, the tribe communities. I think I really see that happening a lot more because people are. Um, I guess a lot more people are starting to become aware that they don't have to necessarily stick with their family, even though they were born in a specific place or whatever. They don't have to stay there. They can search outside of that. Yeah. For people who resonate more with them because, you know, some people are becoming a lot more drawn to certain aspects like spirituality. Others are not so much. So if you're mm -hmm. very spiritual and your family is, then why, why stay there? You know, why not find people who are more resonating with that? So I think... Maybe. Hence my hence my aspiration towards finding my tribe. Mm. You know? Yes. So that's gonna become more of a norm. Yeah. And in terms of um career and work and things to focus on. So for example, maybe loads of people now have lost their jobs, right? What do you think what areas might be more beneficial or might be becoming more beneficial in the near future for people? who maybe is, are rethinking their jobs and maybe they should move into a different career or different field? What do you think is a good sector? Well, it's, it's going to have to be fundamental changes. Look at a country like the US of A, where now you've got something like 15, 20 million people claiming unemployment benefit, when it's normally around 600,000. So all of a sudden, the American economy is going to take a massive downturn. Same as in Britain, same as in most other countries. You know, the economic future we're heading into a massive depression not depression recession mm. uh so yeah we may uh, we're not going to go back to the days of the 1930s because that just led to world war ii and the rise of, of of fascism and that's not going to happen this time we're too intelligent allegedly for this to happen instead i suspect there were so many people now looking at a different way of working in the future is going to be a lot more individual innovation, a lot more people becoming self-employed, a lot more people having a number of different jobs, some of them manual, others more written, others in care or service. And people are going to be spreading their energies in a more diverse way. 
making themselves more multi-talented, multi-skilled, different income streams. Yeah. This is likely to become the new normal, I suspect, over the coming year or two. Mm. And that really taps into the whole self-empowerment theme as, as well, isn't it? About people uh, really knowing who they are on the inside and kind of shining that light out into the world, shining their own individuality, which is what Aquarius is about. Again, being an individual, being different, being um, uh, original, I guess. So. Yeah, I often say to people, well, look, you don't know until you try. It's better to try and fail than not to try at all. Because every time you try, you learn a bit more and eventually you succeed. I used to work on a principle that's called fake it till you make it. <laughs> For the first 10, 15 years, I was thinking, oh shit, can I really do this? Can I do this? Uh, and I was reading every book and checking everything. And I was thinking, oh, yeah, it seems to be working. Okay, fingers crossed. And now it's like, okay, just do it. Mm. And now I can do it. Now I'm making it, but I faked it for the first 10, 15 years. And that's what everyone does in some shape or form until they get that maturity, yeah. knowledge and experience. Mm. And the confidence to do it. And yeah. the confidence, yeah. And what about, you mentioned earlier um, intuition about um, astrology. What, do you think we're now a bit more inclined to combining logic and intuition? Because so far they've been so separate and you see people are either very against, or very against, you know, the whole psychic stuff and intuition and all that, uh, or very for it. So do you see them blending together now a lot more? When I see people who go, oh, there's, there's no such thing as intuition. No, there's no such thing as psychic stuff. And I say to them, okay, what were you dreaming about this morning just before you woke up? Because I say to people, what about your dreams then? Because everybody dreams and dreams never follow any rules. Dreams can be all over the place. Some of them can be good. Some of them can be bad. Uh, and dreams put you into a different consciousness state and then you wake up and you come back into what allegedly is the real world really? and you think about this oh that's oh no forget about it and it's gone yeah. so to me dream state is as real as this world mm. and in the same breath i could say that states of intuition states of higher awareness mm. are just as real as when i'm doing the washing up in fact, when I'm doing the washing up is when I get some of my best inspiration. <laughs> Crazy though it sounds. Um, and it's the same. When you look at a chart, sometimes you just look at the pattern. You don't look at any of the individual parts. You just look at the pattern. And the pattern kind of imprints. And it goes in and then it comes back up. And sometimes you just open your mouth and the right words come out. And you don't even think about what you're saying. Now, you, not many, you, you've got to be experienced to be able to do that. But that's the way it works. It's, it's not just with astrology. It's with any form of, of talent or work that people have become skilled at. They just look at it. They know what's wrong. They open their mouth, bang, sorted. Mm. But it takes decades of experience to get to that point. But also intuition comes into that, doesn't it? Because to look at the pattern and to be able to feel into that, because I guess it has energy, right? Because it, it's geometric and it, has, it kind of has this resonance that you... The beautiful thing about intuition is, is, is rarely, but occasionally, I, I, I say something and I see a client's mouth just drop open. They go, how do you know that? How do you say, how do you say that? And I go, I don't know. It just came out. If you try and understand it, it disappears. Yeah. If the nature of intuition is that you cannot use logic to describe it. Mm. You cannot analyze it. You cannot take it apart and put it back together again. Mm. If you try and work it out, it, it runs away. This is why I say I don't believe in astrology. I know astrology. If I knew how it worked, if I knew precisely how it worked, I wouldn't want to do it and I wouldn't be able to do it. As long as there's an element of magic, intuition and unknowingness about it, I'm there. But if it became just a sort of normal science, I'd be thinking, no, I don't want to do it anymore. No, no magic in it. There's no magic. Yeah, it's that mystical aspect of it that really makes it interesting and something you want to get involved in. Yeah. Definitely. And uh, yeah, and, I, and the Aquarius thing, it also, it, it's to do with other worlds, right? So just like you said, you know, the whole, the dreaming space and now astral projection is becoming a lot more bigger now, like people are trying it and they're realizing, you know, you can, you can leave your body, which we do when we dream anyway, but you can do it consciously as well. And, you know, so that's become- So, 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 you know, if over the millennia, when we've looked in the, say, 500 years ago, 
when we've looked for soothsayers or people to forecast the future, we're looking at the artists or the writers. In the last 50 years, 60 years, we've been looking at the filmmakers. Uh, these are people who are trying to dream what the future is. And, and these days, there's many different ways of forecasting or predicting the future. And it's becoming more and more varied. Um, for example, space travel. For millennia, and especially in the last 100 years, it's been like, E.T. come home. There's aliens out there. When are they going to make contact? And it's like, wait a minute. We now know that the laws of physics, as we understand them, don't work beyond Saturn. It's all different out there. Time is different. Gravity is different. The laws of physics, as we understand it, don't work. Speed of light isn't as fast as we can go, especially with quantum. And everything's a lot more interconnected than we thought. So as we realize this, so the idea of inner space becomes as important as outer space. And actually, I don't believe in little green men or ETs. Yeah. There are aliens on this planet, but they're the humans like the trolls and the people who are disconnected with themselves, who are fearful of their own selves and who choose to see everything in a negative way. They're the real aliens. Mm. Now, there's different dimensions of existence, sure, where the fairies live, where the, I don't know, the goblins live, the crop circle makers live, where we go in our dreams. And they're all parallel to us outside of our range of consciousness. But they are, they're here as well as us. And, and sometimes we make that breakthrough and then we're thinking we're seeing aliens, but we're not. They're here as much as us. They're just indigenous. Yeah. And there is that kind of growing together coming, I hope. Uh, yeah, and someone just said, uh, someone just commented, U UFO sightings have actually skyrocketed in the past few weeks. I had, I read some of those yeah so ufo sightings becoming more and more pronounced when it says ufo it doesn't mean alien or et it just means unidentified yeah no, flying it's, objects it's still something different isn't it it's still very like different and like we're that. on the point of a breakthrough yeah not a breakdown a breakthrough mm. i'm really excited about the future i'm scared well trip like anticipation that. and trepidation not fear <laughs> yeah Definitely. excitement and nervousness it's an excitement yeah, of what's to come but i think yeah more excitement than fear because we know it's yeah. going to be it'll be good because but um yeah i wanted to ask uh, so guys if you have any questions feel free to drop them in um so we can... say, are people still watching us yeah 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 they are everyone's still commenting uh yeah we've got 500 people wow <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah so guys feel free to drop in your questions uh whatever you want to ask steve while he's here just make sure you label it question with big letters so that we know uh you are asking um something but yeah i mean wow this is great stuff i love talking about this and i love talking about the unknown and the mystical and the magical and that's what it's really about and i hope to see more i definitely hope to see more astro like astrology becoming more mainstream and i think a lot more people are now you know trying to definitely trying to make it they like you doing it so many other people are taking it on like i mean the youtube channels are massive now there's people that are, you've got like you you've got like thousands of viewers every day and other people so and you know no one really watches tv i know so many people that don't even own a tv anymore so it's kind of like everything's just converted online then no one tv it's like it's gone that, that the only reason i've got a television is when there's football on yeah <laughs> um when i was doing my master's degree back in 2004 I was working with a number of very well-known astrologers. One of them was called Bernadette Brady. And she said to me, what do you want from astrology? And I said, oh, I want my own office and my own desk and a big chair so that I can sit and do consultations for people. And she looked at me and she went, is that all? <laughs> and I thought, well, it's all I've ever aspired to. And then, then I got it. I got what I wanted. I had the office and the chair. And I was seeing people in my office. And then I realized, actually, I don't need this anymore. I can do it online. Mm. So now I've just got rid of it all because I can keep it minimalist and still be much more effective without having all the trappings. Mm. So simplicity, simplicity, simplicity doesn't mean stupid. It means not complicated. Yeah. So I like simple. And astrology has an essence of the, the, the more you clutter it up with all the paraphernalia, the more mixed the messages, whereas the more you keep it simple, bang, the straighter it goes. Yeah, yeah the message comes through straight and clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Okay, let's see some of the comments here. Uh, someone had a question. Let me just scroll up. Okay. Question, is the mainstream media also becoming more creative, changing in consciousness? Mainstream media, do you mean news by that? Mainstream media. Um, um, see. By the fact that when we were kids, when I was a kid, there was only two television channels and now there's hundreds. Yeah. Even 10, 15 years ago, there was only about 20 channels and one or two things on the internet. But now media is everywhere in every shape or form. So it has to adapt to survive. Mm -hmm. I consider much of social media to be an absolute curse because it's a, it, it deflects attention from the more priority things. I don't have much time for social media at all, apart from YouTube, obviously, mm -hmm. and to a lesser extent, Twitter. But the rest of it is, I, I think it's quite banal, to be honest. Yeah. And, it, and it distracts people from perhaps the more important things in life. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. You know, you have those people that just, yeah, it's, it is it's distracting. I mean, there was a time at one point, I think it was around two, three years ago when uh, all the, the short sort of documentaries or short videos, these inspirational videos came, you know, came out and they were really great because they were very inspirational. And they were about people doing amazing things. And, and a lot of them were like really funny videos or like really touching videos. And those were really nice. But um, now it's just kind of just gone down to conspiracy theories and just 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 stuff that's not very, uh, yeah. You have to, I honestly think that many of the conspiracy theorists are actually bots, mm -hmm. all right? Paid for by, by various vested interest parties. And those people who are, who just see the negative in everything, are genuinely sad individuals, and I feel actually really sorry for them, even though they, they, they really don't like me. Some people really, really don't like me, but and yet here am I, I'm, I'm doing my best. And you know, I often say when someone gives me a negative comment and it's actually really offensive, I just go right by there's the door, yeah, and and, and just go away. Yeah. I don't want to don't want to engage. No. Um, but at the same time. It's the nature of the beast. If you're going to put yourself out there, you've got to take what comes. You can't be selective. You have to be thick-skinned, for sure, if, you, um, if you're if you doing this work. Yeah. Teflon I, mean, I said to you before, I still, that it really boggles me how people actually have the time to spend a good amount of time writing a very hateful message and sending it to you. You know, you can, you can do so much more in your time. Like, why spend all that time to write this hateful message? Like, I don't even have the time to write a positive message to someone, let alone something negative. It's like do something better with your time Why yeah, 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 yeah. That? like that question just said how's media changing some of the newspapers which are still very seen as a dinosaur of communication now some of them just haven't changed some of them become actually really hateful and vitriolic yeah. on the surface they're all wonderful but then they still got lots of very young pretty women in you know, very small bikinis in them and it's like you're so dinosaurs yeah you know wake up smell the coffee Thing, people are changing, attitudes are changing. Just mm. get with it or, or die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely changing. I mean, you see things uh, like Channel 4, for example, they have a lot of online stuff that they're doing mm. now because, you know, they know people are not watching TV anymore, so they have to go online. And BBC, they're doing a lot of online documentaries. Everything's online, everything's changing. To BBC, I've, got, I've got so much time for the BBC. I, I think it's one of the greatest British institutions along with the NHS. And I honestly feel that I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm a big fan of the BBC. I'm going to leave it at that. I don't want to get too contentious. But the BBC and the NHS epitomise the very best of Britain. I mean, they're kind of the main point of that information, isn't it? The, the first point of information. Yeah. I actually trust the BBC. Yeah, that's, no, I, I, have, I don't actually, I'm, I have to say, I'm not a big BBC. Well, I don't watch TV at all. So no, but online, online stuff. But um, online stuff as well, yeah. I mean, that's the first point of information where you go yeah. and get everything. So, okay, yeah. next question: How will Pluto? How will Pluto in Aquarius? How? Will, Ooh, how that's a good one. How long? I'm not sure what that means. Oh, you know what that means, so. When Pluto moved into Libra, um, in the mid '70s, early '70s, through to the early and mid '80s. It, we, we thought it'd be the divorce generation. It did change the way we managed our relationships. When Pluto moved into Scorpio from 94, 84 to 96, 97, 
we thought, OK, this is going to be a big nuclear war. And it was the end of nuclear war. The Iron Curtain came down. All the missile sites were, were most of them were discontinued. What we didn't see with Pluto and Scorpio before it was too late was we didn't. It was also the HIV development big time. When Pluto moved into Sagittarius in 96 through to 2008, we thought, OK, so this is the end of religion and the end of complicated factors in law. Uh, and what we saw was, yes, the beginning of the end of conventional religion, but at the same time, fundamentalism really began to rise big time. So astrologers then said, OK, when Pluto moves into Capricorn over 2008 through to 2024, we'll see the end of or the start of world government. Now, this is actually becoming a bit close to home with the emergence of the super states such as the EU. But we're also seeing a lot more resentment and resistance to the idea of any type of imposed control and government, whether it be at the individual or the collective level. When Pluto moves into Aquarius from 2024 through to about 2037, 38, then we're going to see on the positive side, we'll see a complete transformation and regeneration of attitudes around community, social life, and the way we interact with each other, but it could also lead to a major fragmentation and conflict between different communities around lifestyles and lifestyle management. Again, I suspect it will be the death gasp of religion. Cults will become fewer in number, but stronger, until in the end there'll be one fundamentalist, but there are 10 atom bombs. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Wow, well, let's see. Well, hopefully it's more in terms of tribes and communities that are kind of where people are finding each other rather than kind of fighting. I, believe, I hope so. Yes. Yeah. Uh, someone's asking, what do you think will happen to the current financial system? <laughs> well, um, with the big changes in work practices that are going to be coming up, inevitably, we're going to see some type of correction around the large scale financial markets, the extremes of recent years will not be able to continue. Um, I don't think we'll actually see a complete collapse of the financial system yet, but Uranus has moved into Taurus. And Taurus is a sign that's most commonly associated with things like assets, property, possessions, resources, finances. And Uranus is a change bringer. Uranus moved into Taurus two years ago. It's going to be there for another five years. And one of the things we will see, guaranteed, we will see the emergence of alternative currencies. And it will be a global currency, such as crypto, where there is no banks and no bankers, and every transaction is public. So... This, it, it's, it's, it's not a broken model, but it's the first stage of a new model. So eventually I am looking at some type of global currency, which is going to destroy the exchange markets. If it's just one currency in the world, there'll be no point in speculating in currencies. So I don't see anything wrong with that. Of course, some people go, one currency, the guy's a communist. But I don't see a problem with it personally. I mean, that's what a lot of people have been asking for, isn't it? Because otherwise it's so unfair and so unequal because why should one country be a lot more prosperous just because of their currency to another? And exactly. So exactly. If people want change, then we have to embrace all of it, right? We can't just be picking yeah. what we want. Yeah. Yeah. It may be forced upon us. Mm. I mean, not by anyone or any one group or nation or bank or anything. It may be the force of circumstance because the markets become so extremely volatile that currencies collapse mm. without without some deliberate intervention and some type of new way of managing resources and finances. It could lead to some type of massive economic collapse globally. Oof, OK, so get rid. So do you think people should um, I mean, some people have been saying to invest in things like gold, silver, something that's more um, tangible rather than. online. Um, OK, two things. One is I am very much a supporter of Extinction Rebellion. 
And one of the people I know in Extinction Rebellion, he wrote about it in the Extinction Rebellion handbook. He said he was advising some of the very top people in the world on how to manage their security in the event of some type of global breakdown. And, he, and they said, well, we can't guarantee the trust of our security because we can't pay them enough and we can't look after their families as well as us. So they're investigating getting robots. But, you know, the, the, my friend turned around to him and said, well, look, why don't you just pay everyone a bit more money? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, we can't do that. Um, if you've got this, this, clients come to me and say, OK, I've got a bit of money. What should I invest in? So well, the worst thing you can do is put it in the stock market. As we've seen, the stock markets have plummeted by over a third in the last three months. The Dow Jones was 30,000, now it's 20,000. Yes, things like um, um, uh, commodities, oil, gold, silver, platinum, they go up and down. Gold is at an all-time high. Gold's gone up 30, 40% in the last year. It's stupidly high. It will come down again. And then, but it never really comes down. There's one stock that never goes down, and that's coffee, because the world runs on coffee. But really, the best, if you've got a lot of money and you want to invest it in a way that's both socially responsible and lucrative, then buy residential property for, to, to rent out and pay a management company to run it for you, and you give them 20% of the income, you get the other 80% as being a sleeping partner, People will always need somewhere to live. Rental income is not a quick way to make a lot of money, but it is regular and consistent and stable. Mm. So property, mm. residential property. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. I think physical stuff that you can physically touch is probably a lot more safer than, than like you said, investing it in a stock market. It's a, it's a paper, yeah. Yeah. And there's a guy called uh, Robert Kiyosaki who speaks about all that and kind of how this is a much better way of actually investing your money and putting it into like a yeah. actual yeah. property or something. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. Well, there you go, guys. So any financial uh, questions? I think we addressed, well, Steve addressed them. Uh, next question. Let's see. Okay. Oh, someone asked about... Uh, Dis the disappearance of the Saturn rings. Um, do you know anything about that? Uh, only a little bit. Um, Saturn's rings have not always been there. Saturn's rings are made of absolutely microscopically thin particles, which are the result of various <coughs> excuse me moons disintegrating over the years. And Saturn's gravity either pushes them further out or sucks them further in. The rings do change. Photos from about 50 years ago show the rings as being a lot thicker than they are now and in many different shapes. But this is cyclical. They will grow again. The nature of Saturn is rather strange because it's a gas giant, but Jupiter's gas is hot and it expands. So it's about growth. Saturn's gas, it's so far away, it's frozen, so it contracts. And the rings suggest constriction. And because Saturn's as far away as you can see with a naked eye, it deals with boundaries. So, no, I think Saturn's rings will still be there in 100 years' time. They may be a different thickness or different colour because they're changing all the time. Okay. Uh, I hope that answers. Well, definitely answers. For me, I didn't even know that they disappear, <laughs> so that was useful. Uh, someone's asking that they, well, they want to know a little bit more about the Saturn Pluto Jupiter conjunction energy as other planets conjoin, as other planets uh, conjoin in their small cycles. Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto. Saturn's moved into Aquarius now, it's going to move back into Capricorn later this year. This is the only time for centuries and centuries. It's the only time, I think, in the last 2,000 years. I think. I'm not sure on that. But it's the only time for a very, very, very long time where we've had Jupiter and Saturn and Pluto in Capricorn at the same time. And they've been conjunct to each other. So everybody will, will be aware of this in their own individual horoscope. And if you're a little bit astrologically aware, then look at your chart and look at which house of the zodiac 
this big conjunction is falling in. Look at the area of Capricorn in your own personal chart. See which house it's in. And that area, whether it be the house of relationships or health or finance or, or career, that is the area that's being affected. And this will continue through to really mid-December of this year. Mm. Wow. Okay. And do you think uh, someone else is asking about uh, oh, you have loads of comments, by the way, saying thank you so much, Steve, this is great. So everyone's enjoying it. So thanks, guys, for the comments. Um, someone's asking about, do you think there'll be more ugly things being revealed? Because so far, there's been a lot. Oh, of gotcha. Yeah. Human capacity to be corrupt, sordid, twisted and perverted, <laughs> especially when it comes to treating each other that way. The way we abuse women and children and elders. I don't believe anybody who wants to be a politician should be allowed to be one. Sam's a priest, you know, we should, we should elect people to these roles even when they don't want to be them. Because anyone who wants power should not be given it. Uh, I personally believe that seriously big roles should be given to women. And I know women can be just as bad as men, but I don't want to come across as a feminist, but neither do I want to come across as an anti-feminist, but especially in religion, it's been such a male dominated situation for 4,000 years. And yet the corruption, the perversions that have been done against children and women over the millennia by all churches, it is disgusting. They should be ashamed of themselves. And most of them are stinking rich as well out of the products of slavery and persecution. It is so, Im don't get me started on religion. <laughs> I could go on for hours. One. Exactly. Religion has persecuted astrology. Remember, priests used to burn astrologers at the stake. And witches, yeah. Witches. Yeah, they used to turn them upside down, nail their tongues to the roof of their head, and then burn them to death using their own astrological books. This happened to the professor of astrology, Cecco de Scoli, in 1500 in Bologna. Really? Yeah. Astrologers have always been persecuted by the church. Well, astrologers are interested in empowering people to have their own relationship with the divine, to which the church goes, boy, you're muscling in on my territory. Mm. So, and yet some churches, really good people. Some of them, are really good. Some of them are genuinely pious and well-meaning and community and spiritually orientated. Not the majority, but some. Mm. Yeah, definitely we can't put them all in the same basket, but I no. think, yeah, we've discovered by now that the majority of them are pretty corrupt. So, yeah, there's a there's a really interesting Netflix series. Um, God, I forgot the name, but it's, it's basically about the church and, and a church, a specific one in the US that had been abusing girls, um, yeah, for a long time. And it was, it was, yeah, it was terrible. Um, really, really bad, but yeah, hopefully. Well, it, it, the church was kind of like the middleman, wasn't it? Between us and the divine. So it was kind of that control. Yeah. Controlling. It worked for a long time yeah. when we were working in the fields, but we don't, we don't need anyone else now to tell us what we should be believing or how we should be interacting with God. We've, we're capable of doing it on our own now. So if the church is going to turn around and say, OK, uh, we'll change our attitudes now. We'll act as a kind of mentor, counsellor, advisor, safety net, security blanket, give you advice, do something to help the community, then I'm all in favour of it. But the second anyone starts telling me what I should be thinking or feeling or how I should be believing, then it's like, no, 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 that doesn't work. Yeah. Um, someone's asking if you've met Joy Usher. Uh, they said that they learned from Bernadette and Joy. I know of Joy. I've never actually met her, not to my knowledge. Okay. Um... I was fortunate enough doing my MA occasionally to be sat next to some very, very well-respected astrologers. There was one particular session where I was sat between Bernadette Brady on one side and Liz Green on the other. And I was like, oh my God, these are the heroes of astrology. And I was being taught by people like Nick Campion and, and Patrick Curry. And, and these, at the time, were like the gods of astrology. They're, these are great people. 
I still all alive now, but most of them are beginning to, they're just a little bit older than me. I was the enfant terrible of that master's degree back in 2003, 2004. I was the one asking all the difficult questions. Um, you, you, you were one of those ones. You were one of the difficult one of my tutors. <laughs> one of my tutors was going on about how there's a character in from the Italian in the 1500s, Descartes, Descartes, Descartes. And he's, he, he was the one who differentiated between mind and feeling. And he said, I think, therefore I am. And I queried this. I said, if he had said, I feel, therefore I am, the whole of history would have been different. And my tutor said, yes, but he didn't. He said, I think, therefore I am. And I said to my tutor, yeah, but that's total bollocks. That's total rubbish. And my tutor said, yes, Steve, but bollocks is not an acceptable academic term. Right. <laughs> so, and, and, and so, yeah, that was interesting. But I still think that Descartes was completely wrong. But anyway, that's another story. So you were a rebel from since when you since you when you were young. Uh, I've never considered myself an anarchist or a rebel, but I've always considered myself someone who asks difficult questions. And um, yeah, mm. yeah. Uh, someone's just asked uh, who were the people that you mentioned will be taking a hit from the last half of August, which um, I guess which star signs? It's it's predominantly. It's predominantly those people born over the 14th to the 21st of January, July, April, and October. Not exclusively, but predominantly. So January, July, and October, mainly. Yeah, yeah. January, July, April, and October, 14th to the 21st. Which is a significant, that's, that's sort of 10% of the world's population, 8%, something like that. So it's, it's going to be, there's going to be global repercussions in mid-August. Oh, wow. Oh, boy. We better tighten up our belts for that. Uh, okay, uh, another question. Uh, if we are born with a retrograde planet, do we feel, do we feel it doubt, uh, doubly or when it's retrograde, when, when <coughs> it's retrograde during the transit? So do we feel it more um, than once? The Earth goes around the sun at different speeds to other planets. Mm -hmm. So because we go faster around the sun than most other planets, there'll come a time where we're one side of the sun and the other planets are the other side of the sun. So then if we could see the other planets, which we can't because the sun's in the way, but if we could see them, we'd see them going backwards against the backdrop of the stars. They're not actually traveling backwards. They just appear to be because we're going faster in the other direction. That's termed retrograde motion. And when a planet is retrograde in a personal chart, then the lessons of that planet are likely to be learned more internally rather than they are externally, more as a result of internal experiences rather than external experiences. When a planet is retrograde in the sky and it's aspecting your own retrograde planet, then you're in a very good position to be able to compare your own personal experiences with what's going on in the outside world. So yeah, that's a really good question, really intelligent. And the answer is yes. If you're born with a retrograde planet and a sign and a planet in the sky is retrograde at the same time, you will have a degree of uh, recognition of experience that you wouldn't normally have. Really good question. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's see what else. Someone's asking whether they're launching their channel at the right time. So I guess, w <laughs> would it be a good time to launch something new? Um, when? Now or, or in August? Uh, they, don't, they haven't specified, but I guess, uh, well, in this whole year, is there a good time? Is there more? Fort fortune favours the brave. <laughs> um, anything that you begin, start, initiate, launch, instigate this year, Will I ever do very well indeed, or it will crash and burn spectacularly? You know, there is no, there is no middle ground on this one. Uh, what I am saying to a lot of people is that there does seem to be a time towards the end of the year where there's a lot of new opportunities for fresh starts. And with both Jupiter and Saturn moving into Aquarius in within a few days of each other, in the third week of December, just before the solstice, it does seem that that 
third week of December is an excellent launch point and fresh start point for a lot of people and for humanity in general. December. So I shall be at Stonehenge on December the 21st, mm -hmm. uh, social distancing permitting, and um, yeah, hoping for a whole fresh start. Mm. Oh, wow. Okay, so we should all prepare. So that's, so would you say up until then, we can kind of um, be doing the re readjusting of what we're doing? Because I guess everyone's kind of, a lot of people... Yeah. Yeah, everyone's going to, there's, there's a massive point in time of readjustment. We're, we're all going to go back to work mid-May, early June. Everyone's going to go back to work. And we're going to try and go back to it being the way it was. And then it's not going to work. And then it's going to take three or four months before we think, oh, right, so how do we work this? And new patterns will come out of the mix. There will be a couple of hiccups along the way. But by the time we're into early September, mid-September, the first signs of the new futures should be beginning to emerge. There'll still be further hiccups. But by the end of the year, we should have a new social way of, of, of moving forward collectively in a way that potentially offers hope for the future. Cautious optimism. Mm -hmm. I, I am on record as having said that I do expect COVID to return later this year. So I just want to stress once again, that whilst anyone who wants to take vaccines has, it's their choice. I would never say don't do it if you want to. But I honestly feel that at the end of the day, the only long-term answer to this is through herd immunity and through having a good immune system. Nothing can beat that. You know, There's definitely alternative ways out there of doing things, so. Vaccine. Lots of, yeah. <laughs> uh, great questions, guys. Thank you for submitting them. Um, right. Do you want to take any more or do you want to wrap it up? It's, uh, I can be here. I want to yeah. start to draw it to a close. Let's do a few more and let's call it, let's call it a quits in about five minutes, 10 minutes. Okay. Um, all right. Great comments from everyone, by the way. Thank you guys so much for commenting and all your questions. Um, yeah, it's really, really helpful. Okay. Let's see. Um, Question, Saturn, give, Saturn gives form to something makes uh, tangible limits. Is the time master putting limits, boundaries and wisdom and lessons in karma? So Aquarius is fixed, air futuristic. Okay, I'm not sure I get that. Uh, okay, so something about Saturn having the uh, time limits and boundaries and wisdom and karma related to Aquarius. Saturn is the Roman name for the Greek deity Kronos, from which we get the word chronometer, timepiece. Saturn is old father time. And until the discovery of Uranus, Neptune and Pluto in the last couple of hundred years, Saturn was always seen as the, 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 the sort of overseer, the, the large, big, godlike figure of astrology. And he was seen as old father time. And Saturn used to rule Aquarius. I suggest that one of the things that's going to happen with Saturn moving into Aquarius is that we're not going to break the rules, but we're going to bend them. And that what used to be strict, rigid boundaries of concrete and steel, steel are going to change into transparent rubber and elastic. So we're going, to, we're going to make changes and hopefully we're not going to be breaking things down, but we are going to be evolving things, transform. There's transmutation, where we change the structure of things, mm, yeah. but don't destroy them in the process. So mutate, and that's very air sign thing, isn't it? So it's very Aquarian, mm. Gemini, it's mm. very about mutation, changing, transforming, and kind of doing all that. Yeah, I mean, to quote one of my personal heroes, Terence McKenna, the future is in the imagination. Mm. Uh, Gote in the 15th century, said that whatever you can do or dream you can do, begin it now. Boldness has genius and magic in it. Start now. And what have you got to lose by trying? So, yeah, I, I, I'm actually quite optimistic about the long-term future. Uh, I get really depressed when I get people say to me, oh, we're all going to be controlled. We're all going to have implant chips. We're all going to be vaccinated. And it's all done by big pharma and big governments and they're all going to control us and stuff. 
why are you even wasting your time being alive? You know. Where's the positivity? Come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, someone wants to know about the summer solstice. Is there significant? Is there anything going on around that time? The summer solstice this year? No, not a lot. No. Summer solstice is is just a general time for celebration in the northern hemisphere. Obviously, it's dark in the southern hemisphere. But in the Northern Hemisphere, yes, it's a time of the greatest light. We only get a few hours day of darkness in, in, in Britain. Um, but astrologically, no, this year is not a major feature around summer solstice. Winter solstice will be much more important in the Northern Hemisphere. Mm. I go to Stonehenge at winter solstice. In summer solstice, you get 50,000 hippies. At summer solstice, you get 2,000 tribe people. It's much more community spirit mm, yeah okay great so definitely the winter solstice is more important uh someone wants to know about predictions for world war three <laughs> astrological predictions for world war three world war three well let's see what um happens in north korea no i'm joking uh I, the only type of world war we're going to have in the future is not going to be with guns or missiles. World War Three, if it ever happens, will be almost exclusively fought out on laptops. I mean, I think it's already going on, isn't it, with the whole... Um conspiracy stuff and everything who says who's right who's wrong I mean one thing that's really really grown in the last three or four weeks is the amount of hacking that's going on and the amount of spoofing that's going on so many people are saying to me I'm getting two or three emails a day now telling me that my PayPal or my bank accounts or my Microsoft's been compromised click here to sort it out it's like don't yeah just don't but it's, it's not they're not intelligent these these hackers they're, uh, or rather the people, not many people are falling for it. They're getting desperate. Mm, there's been a lot of that. Uh, but even things with um, kind of like freedom of speech, because there's a, there's a um, online sort of TV live stream, well, uh, thing called London Real that streams, you know, London Real. Yes, I'm very familiar with it. And from Facebook, from LinkedIn, from everywhere. So what do you think about that? Is that, do you think that's going to happen more now, more regularly? Well, I see no reason why it shouldn't. It's causing controversy, it's contentious, but that's not a bad thing. Mm. Um, I'm a bit sort of selective of whether I choose to believe much of the stuff on it. They do seem to deliberately go for the sensationalist and the somewhat wacky stuff, but hey, some people really like that. If someone's that insecure or unstable in themselves that they're searching for paranoid conspiracy theories to believe in, then there's plenty of stuff out there for them to find. Mm. And whether you agree with it or not, it's out there. Yeah. I mean, it's just strange that they've gone to such a length, to such an extent to ban them from these platforms, isn't it? I, I find that strange. Uh, yes, I, whether I like their content or not, you cannot deny people free speech. Yeah, which is, I think, why people have been so riled up over it because there's yes. tons of crap online. You know, there's tons, there's billions of videos online now. But I get so much crap on my site, my site. I get so many people troll me on YouTube, but it's a free world. I'm also free to delete their comments. Mm, yeah, exactly. But you can't deny people the right to say what they believe to be true, even if they appear to be misguided. Mm. But hey, who's to say what works for you doesn't work for you? Yeah. It's your world, your perception. We're all responsible for our own perception. Yeah. So if we choose to believe in a world that's full of conspiracy theories and negativity, then fine, that's your choice. I prefer, and I'm not on Cloud Cuckoo Land, but I prefer to live in a world where people smile at each other and actually mean well towards each other without being off planet. Mm. 
and most of my friends are like that. All of my friends and most of my clients are like that as well. That's, that's a good way to do it. I think that with this is more um, if people, because if, for example, with the vaccines, you know, people do want to find out whether this will be good for them or not. So just like with this information, I guess people just want to know more. They want to be more informed. So whether it's, um, it's uh, a lie or truth, that's, I guess it's up to us, but for them to actually ban those people from, do you, do you think that's going to be coming up more? Do you think we have to restrict ourselves from what we say online and otherwise we'll be deleted or our videos might be deleted and things like no, that? No, no, that can't happen because uh, if you stop people from saying what they want to say, then, okay, you might ban them from certain stations, but they'll find other ways of broadcasting it. And that's where the dark web and stuff like that comes in. You know, you, you can never stop it. You just have to... Um, balance it and to, to an extent moderate it and for all the negative you have to come back with something positive to, to balance it out and that's where people like you and me are doing our stuff yeah. <laughs> uh, someone's asking whether you know about uh, the repercussions for china whether uh, the astrology is showing something or what will become i, I um, um long 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 ago i wrote a little 20 page document on the horoscope of China and I self printed it was only I only printed about 100 copies I've got one left somewhere and I worked at China's an Aquarius country it's Aquarius from Aquarius rising if I remember rightly so when Pluto yeah China's going to go through a massive massive change in about seven or eight years time when Pluto passes on its sun I think China was born around about China uh, January the 26th something like that or well, that's when the chinese politburo took power and declared the chinese communist republic which was the actual date of the new birth date for china so yeah it's going to be massive changes when pluto moves into aquarius for china massive but then the whole world's going to be going through changes in political boundaries the idea of individual countries Borders, they need to become more, less regulated, more porous. At the end of the day, we are one species. If an alien or a galactic visitor was circling around Earth now, looking down on us and going, well, do we want to invite these people to join the Universal Brotherhood? Most of them are going to be going, absolutely not. They're all mad, you know, because they're just fighting each other. Exactly. So we're not ready for that level of... Uh, development yet but we're aspiring towards it yeah well speaking of aliens someone's uh, asking whether there will be contact between humankind and the third kind <laughs> well, there already there's... is there already is my don't even get me started on crop circles i've been going in crop circles for over 30 years and the things i've seen and the impressions i've had and and the things i know just that's what my phd is going to be on and yeah, they're already here. They've been here for longer than us. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And what about, um, okay, um, babies born in the summer? Does that, would that have any special meaning? No, but the baby's born in eight months' time. The baby's born as a result of lockdown. The, 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 the Covidians. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's going to be a really big surge of Capricorns and Aquarians next year. Yes, more Aquarians. <laughs> Bring more to the tribe. <laughs> okay, uh, right. Any more? Let's see. Uh, how do you see the faraway coming age of Capricorn in Sagittarius? Oh, that's quite Wow. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> that is over 2,000 years away. Yeah. I mean, we'll be aliens by then. We'll be maybe flying in UFOs by then. <laughs> Long way away. I suspect by that time we will be we will have expanded out of the solar system. We will be living in different stars, different planets outside of the solar system if humanity is still alive. Fascinating concept. It's it's too much for my little brain to, to envisage 
it's a lot yeah i mean 2000 years away yeah judging by the way things are progressing now it will be a completely different world well look how much we've changed in the last 60 years mm. yeah will be a lot. i mean there's some people that are kind of talking about um having a solar the solar flash you know happening in the next kind of 10 20 years and the whole electronics thing going down so yeah that could happen one one solar flare would wipe out all the satellites the internet would crash mobiles would crash we'd be knocked back 50 years just like that bang we'd recover but it would take years but then while well, preparing for a solar flash we thought okay but what if a pandemic strikes huh you know for years i've been talking about pandemics solar flares warfare on, on computer cyber warfare and then bang it happens just like that bang and then no one was prepared yeah. and now everything's changing so we started on this let me as we approach the end let me come back to this because there's no one out there who's going to make your world the way you want it to be we've all been a little bit molly cuddled in recent years we've all bought into the the internet world for everything you can get everything from amazon and now it's like well wait a minute we've had a bit of a culture shock now collectively and it's time to re remold our views of the world of the way we live in the world and the way we take responsibility for our own lives and that's one thing that's going to be permanent as a result of this virus that's that individuals are going to demand a greater say in the way their lives are li living and that's one of the most positive things about the gradual move into aquarius the rise of individuality within the confines of the larger community structure so i really like this it's about the growth of the individual the 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 assertion of greater individual human rights and the end to persecution on people by age or gender sounds an altruistic dream but i expect it to be in place before i physically die big hopes <laughs> okay yeah, definitely more altruism, more altruism hopefully coming in with all of that. yeah let's hope so let's yeah. hope so yeah right right okay. Steve, thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure to have you. And uh, yeah, it's just mind blowing in terms of only what the astrology can predict and has already predicted and has been for the last, you know, thousands and thousands of years. Um, yeah, it's really impressive. Desi, it's been a pleasure. But what even more has been a pleasure is that somewhere out there in a blogosphere, there's three, four, five hundred people who have been watching this. And I've got no idea who you are. I don't know any of you, or, or I'm probably I do, but I don't. And I just hope you've had a great time. I've really enjoyed this. And if you've had as good a time as I have, then fantastic. We've all done a little bit of good. We've all put a little bit of laughter in. And the world is just that one millionth of 1% of our place. Yeah. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you so much for your comments and for all your questions. I'm sorry if I haven't been able to answer all of them. Uh, oh, Steve hasn't been able to answer all of them, but you know where to catch him. Uh, Steve, uh, Steve Judd Astrology and also Steve Judd.com. Was it .com? Or dot, or .co. Dot .co, dot .co, that's it. So yeah. Steve Judd.co and uh, also his YouTube site. Uh, you can catch him on every week uh, where he does his amazing daily updates of what's going on in the world. <laughs> and I love the jokes that you've been adding to that. It definitely makes my life a little bit easier for the day. There's, there's, there's a few more yet to come. Yeah. yeah no, I'll be keeping doing the jokes until the lockdown's over. Yeah, no, they're pretty good. I love them. All right, great. Thank you so much, guys. And uh, until next time, bye.